And primarily today, I want to discuss two shows, Sweeney Todd and Pacific Overtures. Okay. Um, and then I have a few questions, if we have time, that are perhaps okay. more general. Um, so there are a lot of sort of little detail-y things here that I sort of found interesting. Um, and starting with um, yeah. the organ prelude, and one question is, it was, it's never been clear to me whether the final version of the organ prelude was yours, and it's different on the recording than it is in the school. I wrote different, con I, no, they're all okay. mine, and they're all clumsy, and they're all academic. I just, it's funny because I was trained on the organ when I was 10 years old and went to military school. And I just, uh, uh, I, I just loved the gadgetry of it. The four, it was a four-manual um, uh, organ, a very large one. In fact, I think at the time, it was the second largest organ in New, in, uh, New York State, a second only to Radio City Music Hall, and bigger than the Roxy, I believe. But it was up in New York Military Academy. And I, I was so small, my feet could hardly touch the pedals, but I loved the whole thing. So, uh, and I took one year of organ when I was, when I was there. So I thought I'd be able to, to manage this, but in fact, I really don't know the organ and what makes the textures and what makes effectiveness. So it's quite an academic overture. I'm, uh, <laughs> no pun intended, Mr. Brown. But um, uh, I, I was really sorry that I, I didn't study the, the, the instrument more before writing the piece. It just doesn't, it doesn't sound, it, it's, it sounds like an academic piece. It doesn't have, what, all I wanted was mystery. What I had intended was, that the theater should be covered entirely in black, like the inside of a coffin, and that all the seats and all the upholstery should be in black. And that on the stage, you would see, with his back to the audience, you know, a sort of fan of the opera, organist playing. And at various points in the story, he would pound away with all, uh, all stops open, uh, uh, something I used to do to scare people at, at military school. And, uh, and, uh, and, at, at, and in college also, where there was a, a chapel and, and you could, make it dark and, and scare people. Um, uh, and um, then Hal had the idea of the whistle, and uh, which turned out to be, I think, a much better idea because uh, the grating sound of the whistle is much more unnerving and upsetting than just, you know, big loud sting chords. So that the organ idea eventually was, was scrapped as a presence on the stage, and of course the theater was never covered in black. Um, but we wanted some kind of non-overture music the way, again, a horror film would have, to just get the audience into the mood. And unfortunately, what I wrote is about as scary as, as I say, as an academic exercise. It has no, it doesn't have any atmosphere. And I just failed. So all these are attempts at utilizing themes from the show to make a prelude that would get an audience in the mood, and I, it's no good. I, pr I prefer the show just starting dry. So for, for future productions, you it's not that happy anybody. If, if people use... feel they can do it, fine. If not, not. Maybe maybe there maybe there is a, a way to utilize a certain uh, um, uh, stops so that uh, it would sound better. It's too thick textured. It's too contrapuntal. It doesn't have enough sustained chords in it. I don't. I don't, I don't care. I don't know the organ well enough to ask this as an intelligent question. But I'm just curious. Do you think? The fact that you played the organ when you were younger, does, does that, as a composer, do you use more pedal points? Oh, no, not at all. No, no, no. I don't, think that had, I don't think that had any lasting effect at all. Okay. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You're which, wrong. Okay. <laughs> I said correct it. You, you have this labeled here as the Sweeney chord. Yeah. I don't see that as being... What turn? What I think of is the yeah, Sweeney yeah. chord. Let me see. I'll tell you a second. Yeah, that's it. Oh, oh no, it's the B flat. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't see a minor third. I it's not know. that. It's um. Yeah, I used to hold on. I have to. I have to invert it. This is going to take a little bit here. Okay. I'm going to put E flat in my E flat E G. No, no, it's a slightly different one. This should be that. What's, what is now says F flat would ordinarily be a G flat in, in what I'm talking about. No, it's, uh, yeah, that, that would be a G flat. That's what I mean by the Sweeney chord. Um, however, this is the Bernard Herrmann chord, and I use this elsewhere in the piece, but I don't remember where. But I eventually made, uh, uh, I changed it. 
I changed it, but that is, that's the Bernard Herrmann chord. The chord that I think of as being the chord that's wedded through Sweeney is a minor chord with a sharp seven. That's right, with, with the, but with the seventh right. in the bass. Yeah, okay. and that's why I say if you, if you change that <clears throat> F to a G flat, you'll have that exactly that. You have the D natural and then E flat, G flat, B flat. But it also appears in other inversions yeah. at, at times. Oh, yeah, the absolutely. Score. absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. absolutely. It was, and it's not, I don't want to make too much out of it. I didn't use it as consciously as I have said. It's just that the sound of it underlay. I mean, if you, if you look at the opening number, you look at the Ballad of Sweeney Todd and the way the harmony moves in there, that chord, not this one, but that chord occurs in many variations. And so it informed the music rather than was a specific. And as I was talking yesterday about how something lodges in your head while you're working on a given show, it just kept, kept turning Showing up. up. Yeah, just kept turning up, which you're absolutely right. It's, it's fascinating to me that I changed that F to a G flat. F flat, as a matter of fact. Um, this is opening 1-1, one, one, which actually, um, I guess, intro or... The first ballad. Um, or, or the I sa of the arrival. world yeah. and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and in the sketches here, um, there, there are just a couple of things that I, I found interesting. Um, okay, we're now getting back into, you know, to, to, to eight, <laughs> 17 years ago, so okay. But there have been revivals. Uh, but No, but I mean, I haven't looked at okay. or thought about it. Okay. Go ahead. Um, the, the first thing was memory of ship bells there. And oh, yeah. Uh, I was going to use that. I didn't eventually. Look, there's a, a Sweeney chord again. I'm yeah. obsessed yeah. with it. Um, uh, and that doesn't look very bell-like to me, so I think what that must have meant is, because that's what I call my Stravinsky motif, uh, th what that must have meant is that I was going to overlay bells on Why it. Why don't you discuss when you say the Stravinsky? Uh, oh, well, um, the, the kind of eighth note motion, yada da 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 that occurs, uh, it, it usually occurs when, when Sweeney is about to, to murder somebody and... Um, um, it's a series of th thirds and fourths. Uh, uh, it's all steady eighth note motion, and it's chromatic. Ba da 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 da. -da. It's in fact it ar arises out of the opening vamp uh, of, um, uh, of the Ballad of Sweeney Todd. That sets up all this stuff. Ba da 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 da. -da. You know, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about the opening vamp. But then I had developed that in the opening into thirds, and um, um, it presages Sweeney's madness. And I call it Stravinsky because it just has a Stravinsky texture. It has a wood, high woodwind, dry, dissonant texture to it. And so uh, it's not that it's taken from Stravinsky or uh, has any kind of Stravinsky and uh, uh, either motivic or harmonic particularities, but it, I, it feels like Stravinsky to me. It just, you know, I associate a lot of Stravinsky uh, with, with uh, uh, dry woodwind. Uh, 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 chromaticism. When you would have given the score to Tunic to orchestrate, mm. would you have said some of this to him? Would you have said dry woodwind? No, no, I rarely or? do. I rarely, I rarely say anything particular, John. That, but here is an example of where register counts. The reason it's up there is precisely because I hear it in my head as woodwinds. When Milton Babbitt said, "I hear orchestrally," he wasn't entirely wrong. I, I think I hear pianistically, but. I, know, I knew that the color of this had to do with that skittering thing. I knew this was not a string sound. I knew this was not a string sound. Um, and I, when Jonathan says that he likes to hear me play, I can assure you that when I play that, I don't play it legato. I don't play it staccato, but I play it non-legato. And that tells him that I don't hear it as a string sound without my saying it. And... Um, um, so if you heard me play this, you'd know that it wasn't strings, and yet it's up in the string register, and it seems like strings. The other thing I noticed was the lyric idea, um, but there's no place like home, oh, yeah. as opposed to London. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I, think, I think it's because home, no place like home is so American, I, you know, because that's, that's it's the old uh, sampler song. And um, 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 I think that's why I didn't. I'm, I like London a lot better. But it also gives you a two-syllable there. Yeah. Does that play into well, it? Well, no, or? but that's interesting because, yes, it makes it less square. There's no place like home. There's a finality to something like that, but no place like London. Also, I've noticed one of my favorite things about British music 
is, and it shows up a lot in Walton and in Britain, is, I don't know if you call it a, an appoggiatura on the downbeat, but it's the da-dum, ba-dum, where you hit the downbeat and then follow it with an eighth note. And that, to me, is characteristic of British music. So when I heard London, I thought, yeah, that's very British. Um, I think we touched on this a little earlier. Um, this is your original manuscript for The Worst Pies in London. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing here is um, the would, modulation would, yeah. this from... Is, this is the original, right, before I changed I, it? Well, I think so, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, um, mind you, I can't hardly blame them. These are probably the yeah. worst okay. pies yeah. in London. Well, we see it takes her up there to an E-flat in this. And when Angie hit, gets up there, her voice actually has to change the head. And you'll notice, for example, anyone can whistle. There's a place in the Miracle Song where she and she uses it for comic effect. But really, I wanted her to say, "These are probably the worst pies." I really wanted in the same uh, uh, chest sound. Uh, I didn't want to go, "These are probably the worst pies." I didn't want that. So um, that's why I, I changed the whole. This song, as originally written, and would be within ra Angie's uh, range. It's right. just that you would have to switch because her chest range. It's really only about an octave and two. And um, uh, so I'd rather have her cheat on the low notes than cheat on the big ones. I, the big question here is future productions. The score is the final version. Yeah. But it's more likely, you see, I mean, if this were written as an opera for opera singers, I wouldn't bother because opera singers can know how to negotiate that sort of thing. But there's going to be some mostly by. Uh, uh, musical theater people. I'll, I'll give you uh, two examples of. of uh, when it was done at New York City Opera, though, which do you remember which I, version I, they did? I, it's this version because it's a published version. No, it's this the, isn't the published. Oh, version. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, no, I don't mean this one. I mean okay. the compromise version is the published version. That's the one that's orchestrated. Okay, and, yeah, so and it's that, because of the orchestration. And the orchestration showed up. Okay. Um, two things occurred to me. One is that the climax of Sweeney is when Mrs. Lovett says, I love you, just before he kills her. Angie could not hit that in chest, and when you hear it, her voice thins out. When Dorothy Loudon did it, because her, her voice, her chest voice, she has virtually no head voice, but she has a large chest voice that goes up high enough, and when she, when she belted, I love you, it was horrifying. When Angie did it, it thinned out, and it made Mrs. Lovett less desperate and less crazy and less... Um, I want to say menacing, except she isn't being menacing at the moment, but less, what, well, anyway, less. And um, uh, so, you know, uh, it's nice if, if, if it can be uh, all a mezzo sound right up, up, up to there. Uh, another, another mistake I made, uh, or a mistake I made, was in the Little Night Music. I wrote the part of Anne uh, for an octave in six, but Anne has to be beautiful, young, and be able to play a selfish girl without being a bitch, as well as have an octave in six. Vicky, who played the part originally, Victoria Mallory, could handle all of it. Her voice is light, but she could handle all of it, and she was beautiful. So I used her low register, I used her upper register. Ever since then, there's never been a girl who can do all that until the girl who just did it, Joanna Riding, in London. But all these years, either they can act and they're not pretty and they can negotiate it, or they can act and they're pretty but they can't negotiate all the octave and six throughout the show because she's got to go real low, she's got to go real high uh, in, in Weekend in the Country, she's got to go real low elsewhere. I mean, I really utilized the versatility of Vicky's voice and, and screwed myself by doing that because it meant that I uh, straight jacketed all uh, subsequent singers into into this thing. But did you really screw yourself? I mean, if that was what you wanted, and that was yeah, the idea for that, that was that, that's for that one, one production. The, again, the advantage of writing an opera is that opera singers, if you write a, a certain role, unless it's that, of course, opera singers, uh, operas do the same thing. I'm sure there are operas where the color tour could only be handled by the Joan Sutherlands of the world, you know, every one every generation, and I think those operas probably suffer as a result because they're either done with people who are inadequate or aren't done at all because the, they can't find a, a soprano. I'm not going to sing five e, high E flats in a row. Oh, um, my friends. Mm -hmm. um, I just found in your sketch on the on the cover here, mm -hmm. um, th your arrows and strum here. Yeah. Obviously, where the the sort of the accompaniment chords. But I was just curious. Do you remember 
what the decision making process was. Yes, that it's, that's it's to why keep you some, yeah. If you look, it's 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 period, periodicized every seventh beat. After every seven beats, it occurs. And what I did was I did I wanted I wanted to take the squareness out of it. I didn't want ya da 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 ya da 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 da. I wanted so it's dum ba da dum ba da 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 dum. And so that so 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 it would keep a little surprise going in the bass. And, uh, Why seven, not five? Or well, why not? Mean? I don't know. Oh, well, we see if you take five, you're doing it on a sustained note. Da 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 da. da. You know, you want you want it. Anyway, it it it's uh, it's in that sense, it's an arbitrary choice. Uh, in other words, there's there's no there's no mystique to the to the number seven in this, nor are. Does it come in, you know, seven note phrase or anything? No, it's just okay. that's what I chose. Nor is it consistently seven, but that's the way it starts. It's the point is to keep it off the beat and just keep. I, I utilize this technique all the time, it's all the way through Sunday. It's to, to to not because I'm so self conscious about being square. I will deliberately do that sort of thing in the bass and deliberately do syncopations in the accompaniment figure, even though I'm writing in four bar phrases and writing. You know, I, I don't change meters that much. And um, this is my way of keeping things fluid and liquid. And this is a perfect example of that. I'm glad we have a perfect example. <laughs> um, uh, Greenfinch and Linnet Bird. The f first question is just a about the bird calls and oh. where they came from. How you, did you research them? Did you? Yeah, I listened to birds up in Connecticut. Just and sat them in down. your window. And jotted them down. No, I have a log. I mean, I have an outdoor section. And I sat there and I, looked. I thought, where am I going to hear birds? I know. Because, you, you know, if you live where I live in Connecticut, where there are a number of songbirds and not too many, and they don't screech a lot, and they're the same birds, you know, because they have little homes around there, and they call to each other, and they really are doing it. You know, when Hugh Wheeler came once to visit up there, he was a birder, and he'd say, he'd listen, he'd say, that's a whatever, you know, that's a wren or a starling or whatever. And he would, you could hear one calling to another. And so the, the motifs are quite consistent. And there aren't that many of them, so I was able to discern one from another. And you know, so these are all mostly authentic. Not all of them. Do, do you know if they're authentic for Britain, or did oh, that didn't matter, oh, and that's no, just Mark, too pretentious? No, and... no, 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 there's a limit to research. OK, OK. Oh, I'll tell you something about Britain about this. I wanted the beggar woman to have a lot of uh, uh, dirty Cockney slang. And I have a couple of books on language that involved Cockney and slang. And I couldn't find what I wanted because, unfortunately, they're dictionaries. And you don't find, the, the, you understand the point, it's, it's hard to look, look it up and find, find things. So I made things up. and. Um, in New York, and I gave it to my friend Peter Schaffer, and I said, sort of smugly, uh, listen to this and tell me what you think is authentic, what's inauthentic. And he picked every single inauthentic out, and I said, please don't tell anybody. And that's the way it was on Broadway. When I got to London for the London production, I spoke to somebody there who knows Cockney Slime and gave me phrases out of his own experience, because he was brought up Cockney, although he's now a big music publisher. And um, I was able to incorporate those, and um, so it's uh, 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 so now in the in the score uh, the, it's fair because the score was not printed until later, so the stuff that's now in the score is, is the authentic that's copy. Right. Um, the accompaniment to this song is uh, it's always intrigued me to the, the Yeah, the, that last eighth note always is where the change happens. Da 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 da. That one, uh, yeah. I'm just. Did, did that relate to the bird? Did, did oh you know no, the, no! How that figure? No, no, no! I have a feeling I've used that. I have a feeling that's a, a little trademark of mine. Uh, this may have been the first time I've used it, but I have a feeling. When you, at the moment, you know my stuff better than I do. I have a feeling that has occurred a lot in subsequent things, but maybe not. Um, no, what it is is, uh, it, it, if anything, it echoes the opening. The whole idea of the ballad, Sweetie Todd, is. Da 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 da. It's it's that leaning. You know there are stress notes, and you lean into the into the piece and come back. So everything has this little yearning, wave-like feeling, and I think this is an echo of that. Da 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 da. 
So there's a little dying fall at the end of each of these things. So that the phrases have a little yearning and a little leaning. If you don't change the chord, you're not yearning for anything because you're not looking for a resolution. What happens is there's a little yearning, you know. This is, incidentally, this is the kind of thing I was talking about that's, I, it's probably unconscious, but it's knowing that this is a girl who's yearning for something. So this is characterizing by music. It's very hard to talk about how you musicalize character. Uh, when people talk about characterization song, they're really talking about lyrics most of the time. It's, it's rare, I mean, you know, we could sit down with a Puccini score, and I, I swear he, he, know, he knows how to characterize musically. Uh, but there are not many composers who know how to characterize musically. Uh, the characterization comes from the lyric, usually. Um, this kind of thing is musical characterization. Uh, this would not be the right accompaniment for The Beggar Woman. This would be not the right accompaniment for Mrs. Lovett, even at one of her most uh, 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 balladic passages. It's wrong for her, because it has that kind of, oh, 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 feeling. Um, and that's, that's why I chose it. That's why I chose it. When you do write for character, do, do you think, you know, somebody like Ben or Giorgio or, you know, complex characters as opposed to a Petra or, yeah. do, do, do you find that you write more complex textures in the accompaniment? The, the no, more, it's just, a, just a, the, the, the moods vary uh, according to what the scene is, you know, in the case of Ben. There's the glib Ben, and then there's the heartbroken Ben, and then there's the regretful Ben, and then there's the bitter Ben. And, and when you have scenes that have that color, you can put that color into the music. So you don't use a lighthearted waltz when he's bitter, you know, unless you're... Dylan, sleeping. could I leave you? Yeah. yeah, yeah I want you not his song, but... but, but no, I, would, I, would just, I just said lighthearted waltz just out of, out of blue. I just mean that, obviously, you know, one of the re reasons he sings The Road You Didn't Take the Way He Does is... He's trying to be charming, but he's actually falling into the pattern. As opposed to singing it contemplatively, he could sing a contemplative, you know. Oh, it's interesting, you grow older, and these things pass you by. You could write that kind of song, but the kind of feverishness that's in that song is, is it seems to me, very important for the character of Ben. That's something I'm good at and that I'm sensitive to, is, is musical dramatization. Musical playwriting. I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway. Um, the character of the witch in Into the Woods, you've commented on that she's the, the character who doesn't lie. W would you do anything musically to... Ref is there such a thing, or is there a no, way No, that's to... all in the lyric. I wouldn't okay. know how to do that. Uh, what I want to make her always was either very fierce or very tender. Um, there's a what I assume is a long line no, sketch yeah. here for Green Finch and yeah. but it strikes me as I wow. mean if you look at the line there, it's virtually the melody, yeah, right. which is unlike your other long lines that I've seen. Aren't well, players. but the, the other long lines haven't been worked out in such details. As look how you know, look look how many notes there are in this long line. I, nothing you've showed me so far has this many. Right. And but you see that that is exactly what we did with Mozart 39th. Is is he pointed we. out how the we Milton Babbitt sorry, okay. Milton Babbitt was demonstrating to me with the 39th is, is he was showing the long line structure and how it reflected itself in the shorter section, the shorter section, and even little melodic motifs. And that's what holds the piece together. So this, that's exactly what happened here, is that in working out the long line and working out the melody, they came together so they reflect each other. So in fact, the melody is the long line. So, I mean, this is a, a very good synthesis. And my guess is if you, if you really took apart the other long lines I had, which are sort of the ones we've been going over, are shorthand, they, they, uh, uh, that if you really examine the melodic structure of them, you would find they do echo what's going on. It's just I haven't put the details into the long, pardon me, the long line sketch. Here I was putting the details in. And it sort of surprises me that, in that this is a fairly standard yep. song yes. and yep. where you say you usually don't. Yeah, no, it may be, I'd have to really analyze this and go over it, but maybe this song turned out to be, uh, this was too long and it turned out to be shorter. But as I look at it, it really, it, you know, you say standard song, it is a standard song, but it's fairly long, it's fairly long. Um, there we go. Again, I'd have to go over here in detail. Hard to remember the creative process. Judge Turpin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the song Often Cut. Yes, which 
I understand is something that upsets you. Or I know. Well, you, I, you I, yeah, he's the only he's the there. only character who's who's not musicalized. And if if this song isn't in the show, uh, he doesn't have anything to sing that is his alone. All he sings is you know the the thing in the barbershop. and um, it seemed to me very important. Um, Hal was extremely offended by this song, or he thought the audience would be anyway, and, and because of what seemed to be a kind of masochistic. Uh, you know the self-flagellation, but you know, in Victorian terms, and, and considering the judge and his guilt about his his lechery, it's far from it. And I tried, I tried to in, incorporate some a, a certain comic aspect into it, in the fact that he couldn't take his eye off the keyhole and looking at his knees. Um, I think it works very well. And when we did it at City Opera, uh, I persuaded Hal to reinstate it because by that time the show had reached its shape. And it's interesting that. When this song, there's another reason too. When uh, when we started previews, I thought the show was in very good shape. Hal seemed, uh, says to me that it wasn't as good shape as I think it was, but I thought it was in fine shape. But there was a sense in the first act, in the middle, of longer, and it was because we had just gotten interested in Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett, and then we went to a Greenfinch and Lindenbird where we got involved with Joanna and, and uh, Anthony and Anthony and the Judge. And then we went into the town square, which is really about Pirelli and, and uh, uh, Tobias, although uh, Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett are on the outside. And then we went to the judge's chambers, and it was the judge and Joanna. Then we got back to the pie, sh uh, to the pie shop. And there was, in other words, about 15 to 20 minutes there where we were separated from our main characters and then picked up the thread of the story. And the story is about Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett. It's not about Joanna and Anthony. That's the subplot. So we felt we should cut something. The first thing I cut was half of the uh, 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 challenge song between Pirelli and, oh, it's Pirelli's song, but uh, the, the contest between mm -hmm. Pirelli and the, I took out all the tooth pulling stuff. And that's, uh, I, I think with the same fell swoop, we took out the judge's song. And so there was a dramatic reason. Hal, I think, was very relieved to take out the judge's song, but there was a dramatic reason to take it out. Once the show had found its shape, it seemed like a paradox, but reinserting the judge's song after all this time, it didn't interrupt it as much. And I don't know why that is, but somehow because uh, the globule had held together, it still held together even with the insertion of the judge's song. And so when, when in future productions, I hope it, the judge's song is included, because I don't think it breaks the tension as much as possible. When we did it in London, uh, uh, the guy playing Pirelli was, uh, thought he would be singing both parts of the contest. And when we decided to cut the second half, because again, it, we thought maybe now it would work and the shape would be okay, it still seemed we were spending too much time with Pirelli. Uh, the actor wanted to quit. Hal persuaded him to stay in the show. Uh, it's in, there's a do BBC documentary that shows I've seen that.